Hello and welcome to this technical podcast from AMSYS. My name is David Ackland and I'll be taking you through triggering scripts in Mac OS X. One of my roles here is to develop technical solutions for our customers and as many of you will be aware, Mac OS X has a rich set of Unix tools under the hood that can be leveraged to make the end user's life a little easier. Although scripting is an art form in itself, when you start writing scripts for Mac OS X, working out how to get the script triggered at the right time and by the right user account can be a challenge. So today I'll be covering some of the options for triggering scripts and other actions in Mac OS X. During this podcast, we'll take a look at running scripts at scheduled intervals using cron and launchd. We'll take a look at how you can let your users initiate the scripts using Apple Script applications and payload-free package installers. We'll also cover event-based triggers such as login, logout, or sleep. And finally, how you can leverage third-party programs such as Casper or Monkey to provide a trigger mechanism. Now, before we get started, it will probably be a good idea to mention a few prerequisites. This podcast assumes that you have a reasonable level of understanding around scripting and Mac OS X. If you are unsure, I'd recommend starting by looking at Darren Wallace's blog post, Bash Scripting Getting Started, available at the following URL. Step one, get your script working. The first step in this process is to get a functional script. As you can imagine, if your script doesn't work, the trigger isn't going to help. That being said, there are a few cases where your script runs fine manually in the terminal, but using an automated trigger, it fails. There's a few reasons why this can happen. First, consider which users will be running it. Depending on how you trigger the script will have an effect on which user it will run as. Root obviously has full access to the file system, but a script triggered by an Active Directory user will only have write access to their home area. So depending on what you want the script to do, you may need to take this into account. Secondly, you want to ensure that the environment is suitable for the script. For example, if a script that is reading data from a network directory service is running at startup, you will need to make sure that the commands you've included will still function correctly when the machine is not fully booted. And finally, make sure you test your script heavily before worrying about the trigger. If your script has syntax errors or other general mistakes preventing it from running, it will make troubleshooting much more complicated. So I'm starting off with a short script that creates a receipt file named by the current date and time. A very simple script is always a good place to start so you can make sure your trigger is working. Once the script runs as you intended, you can add more content or replace it with another script. I'm using these commands because they're simple, will run under almost any user account, and with the receipt file I'll easily be able to tell whether the script has run or not. If you're following along during the podcast, you can of course have as long or as short a script as you would like, but I'd recommend starting with something fairly basic. Next, you need to decide how or when you want your script to run. We're going to take a look through a few user-initiated options, including Apple Script applications, package installers, Platypus apps, and Automator. And then we'll take a look at automated options, like running a script on a timed interval, using an event such as login or wake, or third-party triggers from Casper or Monkey. I've come across lots of scenarios where fully automating the running of a script isn't appropriate. A good example of this is mounting network drives. For desktop machines, you can use an automated trigger like the login process. But if there are laptop users who are in and out of the office, this would require them to log in while they're on the LAN just to get their drives. It would be much better if you can provide them with a dock icon that can mount the drives when it's convenient for them. Apple Script is a really neat way to let your users run scripts. You can use it to build self-contained applications with the script buried inside. The main command to use is do shell script. You follow the do shell script command with the path to the script you want to run. You can add with administrator privileges if the commands in your script require admin access. The only catch with this method is that we are using an absolute path to the actual script. If you have dropped your script file into the Apple Script app bundle, moving the app will break the path to the script and it won't run. A way around this is to use the path to resource command. In this case, the script file is in the location relative to the root of the Apple Script app, allowing you to move the app around without breaking the trigger. Once you have your Apple Script running correctly, just save it as an application and distribute to your users. And by distribute to your users, I mean distribute to a small handful of users and make sure there's no unexpected bugs. A second manual script trigger option is to use a package installer file. 
Package installers have the ability to run scripts before or after they have delivered their payload. If you only want to run a script, you can create a payload-free package, which is simply a package that doesn't have any files to deploy. I normally create these packages and provide them to junior IT staff to simplify routine tasks. An example would be binding to a directory service. There's a large selection of options when you bind to a directory. Asking a junior technician to bind 500 machines to Active Directory is likely to result in a selection of machines that are configured just slightly differently. When I ask a junior tech to bind these 500 machines to Active Directory, I'll give them an installer package that configures the options exactly as I need them. When it comes to creating the package installer, I normally use Iceberg. This is a free tool that I find particularly effective at the task. You can of course use another product such as Composer and that will do the job just fine. As far as Package Maker goes, I'd avoid it unless you really like making your life difficult. Another tool you can use is Platypus. This is very similar to AppleScript in its behaviour, but instead of the script remaining visible inside the AppleScript bundle, Platypus creates a Cocoa app that has the script embedded in the code. This is a great option if you'd like to protect the contents of your script from prying eyes. The last option I wanted to mention for user-initiated scripts is Automator. This is an extremely easy to use program that allows you to build a workflow by drag and drop. Of course, if you just dropped in a shell script and saved it as an application, it would be no different to the previous two methods. What is unique here is the ability to save the workflow as either a service or a folder action. A service will allow the user to run a script from a contextual menu item. And a folder action will run when a specified folder has ad items added to it. So for the next section of the podcast, I want to switch focus to automated scripts. The first method of script automation I want to take a look at is to use a timed schedule. The two key tools you would use to set a scheduled script are the Unix scheduler cron or the more recent launch D. Now some of you may be wondering why I'm including cron in this podcast considering that it's been superseded by launch D. There's one very good reason for choosing cron over launch D and that is flexibility. As you'll see in a moment, launch D has fairly basic scheduling capabilities. Cron has been built with a load of advanced scheduling features which we'll take a quick look at. The basic syntax for Cron is simple. You specify the minute, hour, day of the month, month and day of the week in a row, followed by the script that you want to run. Getting more advanced, you can start to see the advantages in using Cron to do your scheduling. For example, the ability to specify multiple times or a time range for execution. With a little creativity, you can set a very specific schedule with this tool. The second scheduling tool is LaunchD. Its primary purpose is to start and stop system and application daemons and has been used by Apple since 10.4, replacing the more traditional Unix startup items and RC scripts. You can use LaunchD to run a script at startup, login, logout, or when specific file system items are modified. Of course, as you've just heard, LaunchD does not favour well against cron when it comes to setting time schedules, but its main strength is the other triggers that are included. For more information about LaunchD, take a look at the podcast by Richard Mallion at the URL below. Once you get used to the syntax, they're not too bad, but if you'd like a little help creating the LaunchD files, you can use a program called Lingon. Lingon is basically a GUI tool that can create the XML file for you. To ensure the launch D will trigger at the correct time, you need to place it in a very specific location. The top two paths in this table are the system launch D folders. Unless you really know what you're doing, I wouldn't add your custom launch D files here. The next path, slash library slash launch daemons, is generally used to run things on startup or before any user is logged in. And the path beneath it, slash library slash launch agents, can be used to trigger when any user of the Mac logs in. The final path is the launch agents folder in the user's home directory. As you can imagine, this will only run if that particular user logs in. So the XML files are essentially the same, but the location is important as it determines when it will try and load the daemon. Another option for triggering a script is to use the built-in login window hooks. This is quite a basic feature that allows you to run a script either at login or at logout. It uses the login window preference file so you can use either mcx or the defaults write command to set the necessary keys. Example syntax is below, you just need to replace it with the path to the actual 
script you're using. I will point out at this stage that the keys can only hold a single value. This is usually not a problem unless you use a third party program that wants to use the login window hooks as its trigger. You may find that after installing the program, a previously set login hook stopped running. One other thing to point out here, login and logout hooks run as root. Depending on the user that you need to run the script, this may have a bearing. The second point is the timing of the login hook. I've attempted to mount a network share with a script configured to use Kerberos authentication, and this method has failed. Essentially, it was trying to mount the share before the user had fully logged in and obtained a Kerberos ticket. So this is just a passing mention. We stumbled across this binary a few years ago and found it to be quite useful. It's got the ability to trigger a script when a machine is put to sleep or woken from sleep. If you have a script that doesn't like being interrupted by impatient users, this will help you build in a little bit of resilience. The final triggers I wanted to mention are Casper and Monkey. There are obviously lots of others, but these are the ones I use most often. If you have a Casper suite solution in your organization, you can very easily add a script to any of the Casper triggers that are available. Monkey requires a bit more work as it is a command line tool, but then it is free. I won't say anything more about these programs as if you're using them, you're probably already familiar with a lot of the concepts in this podcast. So to wrap up, I just wanted to mention a few troubleshooting tips that might help you if you get stuck. First and foremost, make sure your script works. I said this at the start, but if you have a broken script and you try and implement one of these triggers, you won't know where the problem lies. If you're going to be running your script when the user is logged in, make sure that it performs correctly as that user. It's no good testing the script as an admin if the intended user does not have admin privileges. If you're having trouble with your script, try replacing it with a basic placeholder script like the one at the start of this podcast. That way, you can at least confirm whether your trigger is functioning or not. Secondly, make sure that your script isn't quarantined by OS X. If you have transferred it via Safari or Mail, the script may have the quarantine flag set on it and won't run. To remove the flag, run xattr space minus d space com.apple.quarantine space and then the path to the script in the terminal. If you're using LaunchD, check the permissions on the XML plist file. LaunchD is very particular about the permissions on these files. As with any file in OS X, if the permissions are too restrictive, they will not run. I have seen technicians open up the permissions to see if this is the problem. LaunchD sees the permissions are too open and insecure and will not launch the process. If you're unsure if it's loading or not, try using launchctl space load space for, uh, path to the file in the terminal. If there's something wrong with the permissions, launchctl will tell you. Next, I'd recommend adding logging to your scripts. Although this is more for troubleshooting the script itself, if a script is designed to run silently with no output, it is difficult to see if it's run at all. Adding just a little basic logging confirms that the trigger is working or not. And to assist with the script troubleshooting and the logging, use echo in your scripts to read back the contents of variables and optionally add to a log file so you can tell what is going on when the script is fully automated. Thanks for watching this podcast and I hope you found it useful.